So in two other videos, we talked about partition coefficients or so-called distribution coefficients. And we represent them with the letter D and we have some subscript I that indicates the element of interest. So in our other videos, we took a look at the partitioning of cobalt between a metal and a silicate phase. And then in another uh, video, we looked at the partitioning of uranium between, let's say, a mineral like zircon and some fluid. And so we can just uh, talk about, let's say, this is our alpha and this is beta. And we could, so then we can write this in, in very general terms of partitioning between alpha and beta. And again, for this example, this would be our alpha and this is our beta. It's usually the mineral phase of the minerals involved that would be at the top of this ratio, would be the numerator, and a fluid or liquid would be on the bottom. But we can mix and match and write them in different ways. But it's usually a habit to have, if the mineral is involved, to have the mineral have its concentration. So this would be the concentration of I in alpha divided by the concentration of I in beta, where alpha is a mineral phase. And it could be that both alpha and beta are minerals. Uh, we could look at the partitioning, let's say, between nickel uh, and the way it's partitioned between, say, orthopyroxene and clinopyroxene, for example. Well, we're going to look at one last example where we're going to take the case of olivine. And so we can look at olivine divided, uh, excuse me, uh, relative to a liquid. So that would be the concentration of some element I in olivine divided by the concentration of that same element in some silicate liquid. Uh, and what we're going to show here are some precise values, but also to introduce some terminology. So let's say uh, we have not just an element, but a compound. Usually we're talking about trace elements when we look at distribution or partition coefficients, but they don't have to be. They can be uh, oxides, and the, you can take the concentration of MgO in an olivine and divide it by the concentration of MgO uh, in some silicate liquid, a, a magma, and if we do some experiments or even look at natural cases, we might end up with a value of something like 2.8. Now, this is a number that can be pushed around quite a bit. If you increase or decrease temperature, then it'll change that number. Pressure will have a smaller effect, but that effect is very real. Uh, but I also want to look at another case. Let's say we have the oxide Na2O. So if we do some experiments, the concentration of sodium oxide in olivine divided by the concentration of Na2O in a liquid, a magmatic liquid, uh, is going to be something that's much smaller than the case for MgO, 0 0.012. And uh, this is by way of introducing the uh, terminology of things where the D is much greater than 1 and where the D is much less than 1. These things are referred to as compatible, and then these things are referred to as incompatible. Now, for the case of minerals, when the mineral is our alpha that's forming the numerator, the way of thinking about this terminology is if we talk about compatible elements, or in this case, a compatible compound, it means that is it is compatible, that compound or element is compatible in the structure. So we're saying MgO is compatible or happy to be incorporated into olivine, and that's no surprise, given that the, for, the formula for forced right, a dominant olivine component, is Mg2SiO4. But if we think about the solid solution series, uh, forced right phthalate, the other common M member is Fe2SiO4, so that's phthalate. Uh, this is a 2 plus cation that's going in here. Uh, we have iron here that's been replacing the 2 plus cation for magnesium. What about a 1 plus cation like sodium? Well, that 1 plus cation is too big and it's the wrong charge, so we say that it is incompatible. It does not go into the olivine structure very well at all. Notice, though, that we get a value that is greater than zero, so it is not perfectly excluded. In fact, if you analyze olivine carefully enough, you could probably find practically every element in the periodic chart. But those elements like sodium or uranium that don't have the right charge or don't have the right size to fit in for magnesium or silicon or iron, they will be highly incompatible or you have very, very small values, small concentrations leading to very small values for D. 
And then there are going to be elements like nickel or manganese that do have about the right charge and about the right size, and they could be highly compatible. They're, they will have no problem fitting in for magnesium or iron within the solid solution series, and so we can extend, obtain a much more extensive solid solution if nickel and manganese are present in this liquid that olivine is crystallizing from. So this, again, is just a way to introduce this terminology we talk about compatible elements and incompatible elements. And then if things are really incompatible, we can talk about elements that are highly incompatible. And that would just mean that these are things where the D is much, much less than one.